heart will tell you your feet touch the threshold of our house of life. Good day to all of you. Uh, this is Ido Aharoni here with you again. Um, this is a, um, a third um, webinar that we have with a, um, a female leader from Israel. And today I'm very, very happy to host um, live from Israel, uh, my good friend, my longstanding friend, um, Ruti Director, and we'll talk about her life, her career, the origin of her interesting name, her maiden name, her married name. And of course, we'll talk a lot about Israeli art and, and Israeli um, and Israeli history. And like we always do, we will leave uh, enough time for you to engage in a conversation and um, ask um, uh, questions, our esteemed guest. Um, uh, Uti Directo has been the um, curator of contemporary art in the Tel Aviv Museum since 2014. Uh, Tel Aviv Museum, to those of you who don't know, is the primary museum of the city of Tel Aviv and one of two prime museums in, um, in the state of Israel. Um, and uh, before she joined um, the Tel Aviv Museum, uh, she was the chief curator of the Museum of Haifa. She is a frequent guest in uh, Israeli and national, international media about Israeli art, about contemporary art, she has lectured in universities and colleges about art. She is a published author and a wealth of knowledge when it comes to art and, um, and the state of Israel. And we're very, very happy to have you, Uti. Thank you for taking the time and joining us today. Thank you for the invitation and for the generous, for the kind introduction. So first question, um, I know, you know, you come from, um, you were born Ruti Avrahami, and right. you come from a very well-known family in Israel's uh, life of culture and art. Tell us a little bit about your family. Well, my father uh, was a journalist. He was a uh, right. He was working in Ma'ariv, and he was writing about theater. He was also a translator. And um, he lived in Haifa. He came to Israel as a very young boy and he lived in Haifa. My mother's family came also before, before the war and they lived in Tel Aviv and they were involved in the Haganah and the, in the building of Tel Aviv. So I come from, I would say, Zionist, socialist and cultural family. And, now, um, um, before I ask you about the connection, there's a big big story right there of the Zionist movement's connection with the arts and culture. Wow. Uh, not only, yeah, and we'll, we'll talk about that, but I have to ask you about your married name. Yeah. Uh, because I, I'm thinking if I'm a director in a museum, I really, that's the name I would like to have, Directo. What is the origin of, 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 of that name? It's a German it's, name. Yeke, what we say. And it's the family name of my ex-husband that I still carry with me because this is the name of my son so I keep it with me and um, well I can tell you it's very appropriate that's my point yeah, the point well, I want to make is that it's very very we, appropriate we write it with a k you know not with a c like in the German uh, pronunciation and we say yeah. directo yeah yeah so you know one of the things that um, I dealt with in my career um, is the notion that there was nothing in this, the land of Israel before the War of Independence or before the end of the British Mandate or even before the end of the Holocaust, 1945. 
And the Zionist movement, the leadership of the Zionist movement, from its early days, um, attached a great deal of importance to culture and the arts. Can you tell us a little bit about that, that history and where it came from? Yeah, you know, it's quite amazing, but as early as 1906, the Art Academy of Bezalel was founded in Jerusalem, 1906. Just think about it, Tel Aviv was founded in 1909. But in 1906, there was this man of vision, Boris Schatz, who came to Jerusalem and founded an art academy in Jerusalem in order to give people a means of living in the arts and crafts world. So it's really, it's really amazing. And Bezalel was the center of the art in the first decades of uh, the 20th century. People were studying there. But since the 20s already, there, there was a shift towards Tel Aviv. So from the 20s, we are talking about two major centers of the art in Palestine. Jerusalem with Bezalel, with a majority of population from Germany. Most of the German artists who fled Europe after 33 settled in Jerusalem. They were saying that in Bezalel, the language was German. Everybody was talking German, while in Tel Aviv, the artists who lived in Tel Aviv were more towards, were more inclined toward Paris, what, what, what they considered to be more modern, more up-to-date art. And so these are the two poles between them, the Israeli art developed in the early decades. Now, and, many, yes. many of our viewers follow art in general. And can, can you give us some examples of artists from both uh, disciplines, from both uh, school of, schools of thought? Yeah, for example, let's say from the Jerusalem School of Art, the German uh, School of Jerusalem Art, for example, Hermann Struck. Hermann Struck was a Jewish, very established, very well-known artist from Germany who came to Haifa in 1924, very early, and he lived in Haifa, but he was like the leading, leading figure for all the artists from Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, there was Steindart and Ardon and artists who were dealing a lot with all kinds of uh, um, um, etching and lithographs and art of on paper, while in Tel Aviv, we are talking about artists like Zaritsky, Reuven Rubin, eh, Nahum Gutman, who considered themselves to be really much more modern and up to date. And they developed the new language of art that became the language of art that is identified with what we can say the DNA of the Israeli art while the artists in Jerusalem remained a little bit like more old fashioned or more far away from the mainstream of Israeli art. But you know, you were talking about the beginnings of Zionism, but the debate in, when we talk about art in Israel, the debate is whether the art that was, uh, that, that was started in, Europe in the 19th century is part of the story of the art in Israel. Whether art, Jewish artists like Maurizi Gottlieb, who painted a very famous painting of um, the prayer of Yom Kippur in the synagogue, which is in the collection of the Tel Aviv Museum. Is it part of the history of art in Israel? What, what do you think? What's your opinion on this question? Um, I think that the local artists, who saw this painting since 39, it was hanged on the walls of the Tel Aviv Museum and it was considered a masterpiece. But the local artists who saw it were very reluctant about it because they wanted to push away Judaism, Jewish life of the diaspora. It was not part of their identity. They wanted to be pioneers. They were building new lives. They didn't want to be connected with this old fashioned academic art of Jewish people in the diaspora. So it is very unclear the, the, 
the status of these painters, also the, all, the whole, what we call the Jewish school of Paris. Artists like Mane Katz or Moise Kisling. There are many artists who live, Jewish artists who live in Paris before the war. Are they part of the Israeli art? Now let, let me ask you a question yeah. about that that difference, and I think it's a it's a it's a huge question, um, and um, we should develop this discussion. Uh, we know, especially in, in painting, light is a big issue. Um, do you see a difference between the Jewish works that were made in Europe pre-statehood and the work that was done in what was then the land of Israel in terms of light? The depiction of landscapes. You mentioned Gutman. You mentioned Rubin. Right. Um, is, was there a difference in the way they perceived light? No doubt, the European painting were darker, while part of what was the main encounter of the Israeli art, the artist in Israel, was the light, the light of the Mediterranean. They, they didn't know what didn't know what to do with it, so it. Every artist that you, you talk to during those years were referring to this first meeting with the Israeli light. You are right, for an artist, the light is very important. It's crucial while looking at the landscape. And also landscape was very crucial in the development of the art. Landscape meaning depicting a place and a place or a territory, as you know, is at the heart of our life in Israel. What is this territory? Whom does it belong to? What territory do, do we uh, represent? So painting landscape was a very uh, central part of the development of uh, the art in Israel in the first decades and, and also afterwards. I would say no. in, this, in the Zionist uh, era and then it became all relevant again in the post-Zionist era. Now, would you, would you say, and if you agree, if you could explain why, the political leadership in those days was looking to interact with artists, not only painters and sculptors, but also poets and, and writers. And when you go to the old cemetery in Tel Aviv, you see uh, Yosef Chaim Brenner is buried right next to... Uh, you know, to the political leaders of the yeshuv at the time. Mm -hmm. And um, and what what do you make of that connection? And of course, it doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, well, with the visual art, there, there were connections and there were artists. I would say that they were engaged artists. All of them, in a way, were engaged to the Zionist project from their own will. It was not like in the Bolshevik Russia, that there was some minister who dictated what to do. No, they were willingly engaging their art, some in a more sophisticated way, some in a more simplistic way, I would say, but they were all engaged in the big Zionist project, one way or another. This is what's so amazing about Israeli art, because also when you look at abstract art, or at the abstraction, I would say, at the way towards abstract, abstraction that started in the 40s, you can realize in retrospect that it was also part of this uh, being engaged to the big story of Zionism. Wanted to be modern, secular, this is important. The modern artists wanted to be secular. They, they, want, they did not want to be connected with religion or with Judaism or with diaspora. They consider themselves modern, secular, and avant-garde. This was how these are the roots of the art in Israel, Israeli art. Now, a, a big, which is a, a wonderful opportunity, what you, you bring up a very important point. Many, you know, Israeli artists, or we call it Palestinian artists, pre pre-statehood, um, found it very difficult to express themselves in what was then the land of Israel because of all sorts of reasons. Sometimes there were, you know, um, 
physical reasons. They, they couldn't make a living. They couldn't. Um, and many of them um, basically left Israel and did extremely well elsewhere. And um, can, can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, I think it was a phenomenon at the time. Israel was and still is an isolated place when referring to culture. There is no question about it. It's still an isolated place. An artist who want to succeed, succeed internationally, they, they have to leave. They have to go elsewhere. Um, so at the first decades of the 20th century, people were going mostly to Paris. After only, only from the 70s, people began, artists began to move to New York. To America, but today it's very common for young artists. They finish school, they do their first degree in Israel, and then usually they realize that in order to succeed, what they consider a success, they go to uh, MFA studies abroad in New York, in Paris, in Geneva, in, in London, everywhere. Israel really is a very small place for cultural life. And in Israel, there are today, we can say there are two main museums in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. And actually, Tel Aviv has become the only center for artists. It, it used to be, as I, as I was telling you before, there used to be two centers. Jerusalem was a very vivid center. But gradually, more and more artists moved to Tel Aviv. More and, more and more artists in all the fields of art. Most of them live in Tel Aviv. Perhaps it's too small a country to have more than one cultural center. So it's very crowded, a lot of passion and a lot of uh, creativity is focused in very little, in a very small place. Now, let me ask you, since you, you brought up the, the issue of the museums, um, COVID-19 obviously changes the experience of learning, changes the experience of education and enrichment. And here we are gathering with hundreds of people. Uh, you're in, in, in Israel and hundreds of people in New York. Um, how do you think this will affect uh, the museum experience? That's the first question I have. And the second is, um, is it just about showcasing art, or maybe the role of the museum is to do more than that? Well, as for what uh, COVID-19 made to the museum, you know, it was an, an unbelievable year. Uh, the museum was closed for three times during this year. And uh, we have really, we had really, I'm talking about the Tavi Museum, but all the museum, we really had to rethink about what we are doing what we want to do. Uh, on the other hand, the re reality sometimes, the reality from the outside sometimes penetrates the museum and make what's inside the museum relevant in an unpredictable way. I will just give you an example. I was opening an exhibition that I curated on February 6, 2020 an exhibition of William Cantridge. William Cantridge is a, the most prominent South African artist, Jewish artist from Johannesburg. And we exhibited his video installation called More Sweetly Play the Dance. It's, it's a stunning video installation from 2015 based on the dance macabre, on the dance of death from medieval times, which is um, an invention of medieval times that was that uh, uh, appeared in the 14th century after the Black Death of the fifth, uh, 14th century. The Black Death was the most horrible pandemic of medieval times. And William Cambridge, in his studio in Johannesburg, reflecting the pandemics in Africa of the time, which were Ebola and AIDS, made this amazing video installation based on animation drawings and video of um, a procession of people walking, dancing the dance of death, the dance macabre. 
And as you know, museums plan their exhibitions way in advance. So when we plan to show more sweetly play the dance, we could not have realized that there will be a pandemic in the world. And when we opened the exhibition, beginning of last February, COVID-19 was already in the air, but it was more like a distant rumor. But then the people who entered the exhibition all of a sudden saw people dancing the dance of death as a reaction to a pandemic in the world. It was amazing. Four weeks after the opening, the museum closed. The exhibition remained in the empty halls of the museum. And it was reopened three months later while we were after the first lockdown. And all of a sudden, this work from 2015 based on the pandemic of 14th century became so relevant, so actual. So sometimes you can't, ex you can't predict how art can relate to your reality. But you were asking about what museums are doing today differently. So during the lockdowns, the Tel Aviv Museum made several projects that were all digit, digit, on the digital uh, website. We were doing works with artists who were preparing videos about their experience in the lockdown. And for example, I'm working now about another project with another curator from the museum that will take place outside of the museum in an underground parking lot outside of the museum for people to watch while driving their cars. So it's something we had to invent in order to think about the situation that we were all experiencing during this year. And to think how our capsules are living in capsules these years, this passing year, will be uh, translated into an experience of driving in a car in a dark parking lot watching 15 video works of art. So this is something a museum has to invent in order to remain relevant and remain um, and respond to the to their reality. What's outside. Yeah, and, and, and uh, we also uh, read um, uh, in the media about the, um, the Jeff Koons uh, exhibit that uh, that was uh, um, negatively was impacted by the uh, by the pandemic, but it was made possible through the generosity of my dear friends um, uh, Maria and, and Jose Mugrabi. Can you tell us a little bit about the the Jeff Koons experience? That was really unbelievable because the production of this exhibition is it's it's a huge production. It's it's, and it's a huge challenge for the museum, for any museum, to put on a show like this of Jeff Koons. He was supposed to come to Tel Aviv, which was also a very, something that we all were very looking forward to. Um, he didn't arrive because the day he was supposed to arrive to take the flight to Tel Aviv, it was a day that flights were canceled. So the exhibition opened and after three days, the, exhibition, the museum closed. And it remained in the museum until recently. Actually, the exhibition was at the museum going through the three lockdowns of, uh, of the passing year. And between the lockdowns, it was open. Thousands of people came to see it. And it became like, uh, you know, uh, a symbol perhaps of this time, a, a complicated symbol of this time. Because one of the um, uh, results, one of the um, things that we understand from the pandemic is the art world is playing quite a crucial role in the global warming, not a positive role, because of the shipment, because of all the international uh, exhibition, because of going to Biennales all the time. So the art world in general 
is rethinking about its activity. And the Jeff Koons exhibition is like a symbol of this, I would say, old world where huge works of art with a um, professional team is going from one place or another to install an exhibition somewhere. And at least one of my um, understanding from this year is that art should think more locally about what's around it, what's around it, and not so much looking for wow arts or spectacular art events. Now, your, your job is also to follow the trends. And I know many of the people watching us right now um, are following new talent. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about your exploration, new talent in Israel, <laughs> maybe all talent in Israel? Tell us about your favorites. Um, my um, position at the Tel Aviv Museum is curator of contemporary art, international art, not local art. But as I was saying, first of all, it's blurred. The uh, the vision between local and international is blurred, but I see when I think about contemporary art, of course, I think also about uh, local art. So an exhibition I opened just recently talking about new talents is an exhibition of um, men of 95 years old. That His name is Melech Berger. He never had a show, nor in a gallery, nor in, in a museum. He is what we call an outsider art. He is definitely autodidact, self-taught, who, who is working with materials from nature, only materials from nature. For me, it is a discovery. It's something very exciting. It's and and, and Melech, Melech, Melech Berger has Berger. been working as an artist for many years, but only now is getting recognition. Until now, he had shows in schools or in cultural centers, but never within the art world. Surely not in a major museum like the Tel Aviv Museum. Wow. Um, yeah, it's very moving. It's very exciting. I, and, I, 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 uh, I would like to do a program with him. I, um, <laughs> yeah. I would like to document this. Right. I mean, this is incredible. A 95-year-old artist who's given a chance to, uh, to put his art on display in a major museum, that's big news. Yeah, and you know, and, he, uh, he was brought up in Brazil in one of the farms that the Baron Hirsch was establishing in Latin America. So he was raised in a farm, in an agricultural uh, surrounding. Then he became a communist in Brazil, uh, was prisoned, and because he was arrested, he, he immigrated to Israel. He was in several kibbutzim, but didn't uh, get along. At the end, he lived in Be'er Sheva, work, worked as a gardener. He's still a communist. He's very ideological man. And when I was saying before that about artists being engaged to ideologies, so Melech Belger is the most engaged artist I've ever known. He's still talking about peace, equality, uh, equality between nations, genders, sex. He's an unbelievable guy of uh, 95. So um, we already have people responding to this story yeah. and asking for a link to this. Uh, so what we will do, we will ask the wonderful staff at the Stryker Center to share a few links with you after the, the conversation okay. is over. Now, you yes. mentioned Bersheva, and some of our viewers are already asking about other hubs of art in Israel. So you mentioned Tel Aviv today is the place because it's the cultural capital of Israel. There is an artist colony up in Safat. We know there's something going on in the Negev, in Mitzpah Ramon, maybe in Beersheba. What's happening outside of the big hub of Tel Aviv? Well, the colony, the artist colony in Sfat is no longer existing. It used to be um, 
live and kicking in the 60s, but really not anymore. But there is a, a lot of um, periphery, cultural activity in the periphery, in the periphery. First of all, in several kibbutzim, there are galleries, art galleries that are very good, very professional. And they are um, playing an important role because they give an outlet for many artists. As, as I was saying, there are many artists in, the, in, in Israel, very good artists, but not enough places to show them. So the galleries in the kibbutzim are very important. And there are places around in En Harod, in En Hod, um, in Be'er Sheva, in Haifa. Uh, thanks. So we are grateful for these other places that are surrounding the centers in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. Now, um, there's, a, there's a question that is very relevant. You know, recently, um, this new uh, digital work of art was sold by Christie's for this imaginary amount of money. Um, and people on the call are, are interested in hearing from an expert like you. What do you think about this trend as digital art? And, um, and what do you think about the whole idea? I still don't get it, I must say. And I still believe huge, absurd amounts of money are being spent of, on art. I don't think it's healthy and I think it corrupts the art. This is my feeling. Really, it's really became a total absurd that tens of millions of dollars are spent on art. This is not what art is about. Um, yeah, but of course the art market is important, but within a reasonable uh, limits. And and I think that the reason is because art and finance, you know, um, found a, a, a common ground and became a form of investment. And um, and and of course, it's happening uh, mostly in in very wealthy countries, also happening in Israel. Tell us a little bit more about the museum about the scope of the activity. Tell us a little bit about the history of the museum. You know, I was mentioning before Boris Schatz, the incredible guy who founded Bezalel in 1906. So there, are, there were some other really uh, men of vision in these early years of the state. One of them was Dizengoff, Meir Dizengoff, who was the first mayor of Tel Aviv a guy with a very bright, very bright guy and very sharp senses. So he, at the late twenties, said that every proper city should have a boulevard, a plaza and a museum based on the European uh, model. So from the late twenties, he was dreaming about having a museum in Tel Aviv. He approached uh, Chagall. Mark Chagall was the most famous Jewish artist of the time. He offered him, first of all, he invited him to Tel Aviv, to young Tel Aviv, small Tel Aviv. He invited him and he offered him the job to be the director of the new museum and Chagall knew better and he said, no, thank you, I will stay in Paris. But the idea of the museum evolved and then Mayor Dizengoff gave his own private home on Rothschild Boulevard to the museum. The museum opened in 1922. Next year, we are going to celebrate our 19th anniversary. So the museum started in the private home of the mayor of Tel Aviv. Imagine it. And when Dizengoff died in 36, his home stayed the, the place of the museum. And then he looked for um, a director for the museum. And you know, history is so makes things so amazing. There was a Jewish scholar, art historian, Karl Schwarz from Berlin, who was considered a very important guy in the art, in the field of art. And on January 24th, of 1933, Karl Schwarz opened the first Jewish museum in Berlin. 
can you imagine it? January 33. And on January 13th, Hitler came to power, became the Kanzler of uh, Germany. So Karl Schwarz was opening the Jewish Museum in Berlin, but he already he had sharp senses as well, and he realized what is going to be. So when Dizengoff offered him to become the director of the new museum in Tel Aviv, he accepted the offer. He arrived to Tel Aviv in June 33 and became the first director of the museum in Tel Aviv. And then he called all the collectors he knew, all the Jewish collectors he knew in Europe, all over Europe, and told them, please send us your collections because you can't tell what will be the destiny of your collections. Those who listen to him send the museum their collections, and this is how their collections were saved. Those who didn't believe him, you know, their, all the art of the Jewish collectors was looted by um, the Nazi regime. And so there are incredible stories about the uh, foundation of the collection of the Tel Aviv Museum. It's rooted in the history of what happened in the in Europe in the 30s. Now, and, yeah, that brings a, a very very important question. So, you talked about um, Israeli um, artists that are you know Israel is very small. Israeli artists are uh, looking to grow elsewhere, but Israel's uh, one of Israel's most amazing success stories is the story of immigrant absorption. And I remember uh, my own father who died four years ago at the age of 91, was not an artist. He was in charge of uh, cultural affairs in my hometown of, of Holon. And he told me that in the early 1950s, um, someone told him that there's a survivor working as a night guard in one of the construction sites in Holon, but that that survivor is a very famous, was a very famous painter in Europe. And, uh, and my father arranged for him a, a little exhibit. Um, this person was, because of the Holocaust, uh, he changed completely his art and his style became only dark. Uh, and his name was Hofstadter. I don't know if you know the name. Yeah, sure. Ozias Hofstadter, yes. Yes, Hofstadter and, and there were many stories like that of yes. people that came from elsewhere, whether people who survived the Holocaust or Russian immigrants who came in the 70s or Russian immigrants who came in the 90s or people from Ethiopia that came or people from Yemen. And uh, do we see any, any blend? Can you tell us about what happens in that, in that you know, meeting of the minds? Today we see more of these different uh, um, poles, because until I would say, until the 80s or the 90s, the Israeli art was quite dominated by a hegemony of taste and of artistic preference. There was a certain aesthetic that was the mainstream and all the others were rejected. Uh, socialist realism art that was dealing with issues of the Holocaust and etc. It was considered not proper for the art itself because the art was really about being abstract, modern, secular, etc. But today it's changed. It's mar much more um, pluralistic and much more accepting different kinds of uh, styles and issues that artists are dealing with. So there are artists from Ethiopia, there are artists from Russia, of course, very interesting um, stream of artists from Russia. And um, you can see that the art is, as in Israel has become much more pluralistic than uh, before. Now we have a few questions from the audience. In fact, you answered some of them already. Um, there's a question coming from Susie asking um, about the Chagall windows at the Hadassah Hospital. Um, is there, um, Susie is thinking maybe there's a reason for, for it to travel. Maybe do you think it will stay there forever or is it uh, going to travel one day? 
you know, it's a site-specific art, part of its strength, it's that it belongs to a certain place. So I don't think it should travel. I think it's beautiful to have art that is connected to a certain place. And talking about Chagall, by the way, the first painting in the collection of the Tel Aviv Museum is a painting by Chagall, donated to Mayor Wiesenhoff. So it still carries on the number one in our collection and it's hang on the wall. So the connection with Chagall came to Israel several times and it is part of the history of Israeli art in a way. Yeah, and uh, we have a, a comment here from uh, yeah. Dave Metzger about uh, the importance of light, not only in painting and sculpture, but also in architecture. And he mentions the fact that Tel Aviv is also known as the white city because of the great oh. influence of this, those architects, the same architects mm -hmm. that, that fled Europe um, because of Nazism and came to, uh, to Israel. But the Bauhaus is not only limited to Tel Aviv, you should know, right. uh, our viewers should know that there's plenty of Bauhaus and Haifa and even in, in Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, and, yes. um, and, um, and again, it's based on a rejection of old fashioned architecture and on this inclination towards modernist, pure abstract forms, which is what the Bauhaus uh, style was about. I've seen someone now, ask, Yes, about uh, Dizengoff's wife, which is right, because his wife was Sina Dizengoff. She was the one who introduced him to art, which is very true. Yeah, and that's, um, there's a question coming in from Terry asking about the collaboration, relationship mm -hmm. between the Tel Aviv Museum and the Israel Museum, if you can say something about that. Uh, yeah, we sometimes, we... Uh, exchange works from the collection between the two museums. I think it's a very good question and it's something we have to think about it about, but you know, it's something that is very common in uh, big in big uh, countries. But think about it, the, uh, Tel Aviv and Jerusalem are, are only 45 minutes apart. So there is no sense like for having a traveling exhibition between Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. The distances are not far enough, but in other ways, we, I think we truly have to develop more this uh, connection with the museum. Yeah. Now, Lorraine is asking a very, very important question. The role of um, Israeli Arabs in right. contemporary art. You know, when I was uh, talking at the beginning, I kept on saying art in Israel because the very mention of Israeli art is a political statement. What is Israeli art? Does Israeli art include the Palestinian artist? So there is a lot of debate even just how to define our subject of uh, talking, what we are talking about. So when I say art in Israel, it's more general. There are very good Palestinian artists. Some of them consider them, themselves to be Palestinian Arabs. Some of them call them some call themselves Palestinian Israelis. But there are artists, and some of them were already shown in the museum, the museum in Haifa, in Tel Aviv. In Tel Aviv, we had a show about of Michael Chalak, who is an artist from uh, Haifa painting beautiful figurative uh, paintings. And um, so they are becoming part of the art scene, the local art scene. Not all of them want to show in the museum. This is another issue. The more political engaged Arab artists do not want to be shown in an Israeli museum, in an um, in a public museum like the Tel Aviv Museum or the Israel Museum that are so very much um, identified with uh, Tel Aviv or with Israel. So this is another problem. We would like to show more than what they would be willing to. Now, would you say, you bring up a very interesting point. Would you say that, um, that in Israel, art in general is more political than elsewhere? 
the art is very political. I would say even, even if artists want to escape this title of pol being political, they can't ex escape it. The situation is so intense that even if an artist, for example, will paint flowers in his studio, it would be political because they will say, ah, you intentionally ignore the reality. So it's impossible to escape the reality one way or, or another. And, um, but many artists deal with it directly and many and others deal with it indirectly, but it's always there, I would say. Now I have two last questions for you from the audience. One, what's your assessment about the Abraham Accord, um, the new relationships that are evolving between Israel and the Gulf region, especially the UAE and Bahrain? Do you see any room for collaboration? And then the last question is about the role of the museum in the regional school system. You spoke about the, the uh, localizing the impact of the museum. Uh, what kind of work is being done with the school system in the greater Tel Aviv area? I'll start with the, the second question. There's a lot of work being done in education uh, within the museum. The departments of education at the Tel Aviv Museum and also in the Israel Museum. And I would say each of the museums in Israel is very elaborate and people are doing, making a lot of effort for, for young people to come to the museum. There is a lot of work being done within the museum. And uh, as for the, uh, the Court of um, Emirates, I think it's a huge, it has a huge um, horizon for, for us, for collaboration. I'm very curious about possible collaboration between us and the Emirates. Wonderful. Uh, Ruti, I, I couldn't thank you enough. I mean, this, is, this has been wonderful. You, you educated us and you shared with us um, a little bit of your vast knowledge and experience. And, um, and I, I take away uh, a very optimistic outlook about the future of Israeli art and Israeli culture, this cultural blend that we have in Israel, very, very unique. And, um, and uh, only good things uh, we should all anticipate coming from Israel when it comes to art and culture. Thank you so Hi. much for taking the time. We, Thank you, uh, and I hope to see you all in Tel Aviv at the museum and... Oh, I'm sure after this conversation and um, and please share with us some links so okay. that we can share with our viewers, especially uh, Melech Berger is, uh, seems like uh, there's a great deal of interest in his work. Um, so thank you so much and greetings thank you. and you all keep safe and we'll see you until the next series. Thank sure. you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.